I don't need to tell you that it's the number one think tank moving the world toward world government, do I? Do you know that already? That the Club of Rome is the number one think tank we're moving behind the scenes to bring the world into global government. And he was appointed the president of the Club of Rome in Madrid on November 28, 2000. I happened to have a copy of his speech that night. This is when he assumed the role as the president of the Club of Rome. Maybe he might say something interesting. Maybe he might say something significant. He said this. We come together in the context of universal values. I personally question the coinage of globalism and prefer the term universalism because we share in universal values. I recognize the work of one of our distinguished colleagues in the Club of Rome who refers continuously to one civilization with 10,000 cultures. We come together in the context of knowledge and of innovation and to speak of globalization as a fact which must be faced squarely. I call for an ethic of human understanding, for an ethic of human solidarity. He went on to say this. I would like to suggest that in today's troubled world, the interreligious reactions to events in many parts of the world, not least of all my own, which have now assumed hegemonal national dimensions, need a cool head and a warm heart not to judge others, not to challenge the legitimacy of fear, but to offer a beacon of hope. Now, in meeting with my colleagues in the International Interreligious Foundation of the UK, I would like to assure you that as Jews, Christians, and Muslims, if we observe on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday strictly, we would never see each other. We then move to fear the folks back home. I recognize with great warmth and importance of developing peace in this troubled world. And I recognize in particular the words of a peacemaker of yesteryear, my colleague Shimon Perez, who said not so long ago that to achieve peace, we need to achieve peace at home. And I say here, we have to achieve peace with ourselves. We have to achieve peace with our neighbors. And we have to achieve and develop peace with the modern age. And I hope we are not leaping into the future when we speak only of peace with modern, modernity. I hope we can also speak of bringing the old world into a new age. And he concluded by saying this, In this common human privilege which we all share, there are no privacies and no monopolies, no exclusive holiness, no peculiar peoples, only distinctive races and climates and living spaces and environments and a rich diversity of cultures all under God in an equal benediction and in a comparable risk to their ever generous Lord. The excellence of Jerusalem is to have been and to remain one redoubtable of such capital cities summoned as such to be the joy of the whole earth. And he sat down. Now you tell me why he talks about Jerusalem being the joy of the whole earth. You tell me how he says that there are no special monopolies and no exclusive holiness and no particular peculiar peoples. He's got an agenda. It's clear. Now let's quickly return to Daniel's prophetic words. As he said this in Daniel 8, 25, Through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. Crown Prince El Hassan is personally committed to being a religious unifier and to bringing the three major world religions, Jewish, Islam, and Christianity, together. He says it over and over and over again. Go to his personal website, and in five seconds you'll find it. His, he personally, by the way, oversees numerous organizations founded for these interfaith aims and goals, along with personally hosting and moderating gatherings, which bring all religious leaders and expressions together for dialogue and cooperation. I have documented, and I don't have time to give them all to you today, 
I have documented literally hundreds of speeches, actions, and gatherings that are far too numerous to reveal within this message in which El Hassan can be proven to be the single most influential spokesman for interfaith goals to promote peace among all world religions. I know that's a bold statement, but I can prove it in my upcoming book. I'll share the documentation. The point is this, folks. The coming man of sin will have the satanic ability and the empowerment to unite all religions of the world together. You know it. It's described during the tribulation period in Revelation 17 and 18. And oh, by the way, the very name and the place in the earth which God identifies with this false religious system is Babylon. This is his latest book. If you consider yourself a student of Bible prophecy, I challenge you, get your hands on this book and And read read it as I have done. I'm not selling any. I don't make a dime off it. You'll have to find it. If you claim to be a prophecy preacher, read this book. In this book, which is El Hassan's latest book, it has come out post 9-11. And he... He recognizes this new clash of civilizations, the post-11 struggle between Islam and the West. And El Hassan writes this current work to offer his personal answers and assurances that Islam means us no harm, by the way. After all, Islam is a peaceable and just religion, you know. And this book spells out his goals, his agenda, and his mission more completely than anything else he's written. This one book merits an entire message all its own. And I'm telling you, it's must-reading if one seeks to accurately and fully picture this unique man. The book back cover, that's all I have time to give you. Just read a book by its cover, right? The back cover says this. This book is an incisive personal statement about the essence of Islam by one of the world's leading advocates of interfaith dialogue and understanding, Prince El Hassan Ben Talal of Jordan. There's much ignorance about Islam in the West, and negative opinions of Islam feed on that ignorance. The views and attitudes about Islam and public dialogue since the Osama bin Laden-inspired terrorist attack on September 11, 2001, require a response. A response that sets Islam in a light that shows its fundamental belief structures and its humanity. The core of this book is a statement of belief in a question-answer format that allows Islam's basic tenets to be quickly grasped with a wide audience. And Prince El Hassan's answers are precise and informative. And it continues and concludes with this. He presents a persuasive argument that the beliefs and culture of the majority of the Islamic world not only are compatible with, but are contributive to world at peace. A world of diversity in which Muslim and non-Muslim nations can and should collaborate to create a more humane and just global society. He cites that the Quran, the Hadith, and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, and he describes how most of Islam during most of its history has applied the teachings of the Prophet so as to treat other ethnic groups, cultures, and faiths, quote, especially the Jewish and Christian monotheists, with respect, tolerance, and fairness. You see, you guys are all wet. You went to that prophecy conference, and they indoctrinated you and told you that Islam didn't want peace. And after all, if anybody can speak for Islam, it's the descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. And he is going to tell you how Islam has been so wonderful to embrace the Jewish and Christian monotheists with respect and tolerance and fairness. Once again, we're reminded of the words of the Daniel of the Prophet because he said, But he shall come in peaceably... And he'll obtain the kingdom by flatteries. January 28, 2004. The new school university in New York 
a forum entitled A Muslim Centrist Platform for Democracy in the Arab World. Big, long sentence, but that's what it is. It was sponsored by Dialogues, an organization for Islamic world, U.S. and the West. This organization's board of advisors, by the way, includes numerous political and religious luminaries from across the globe. Prince Al Hassan gave the major presentation, surprise, surprise, and was followed by a panel discussion, including Prince Hassan, Mustafa Talili, who's the founder and director of Dialogues, Bob Carey, who is president of the university and former U.S. senator, and none other than Stephen Rockefeller. Now let me just tell you a little bit of what happened in this Dialogues gathering. Mustafa Talili began the discussion by praising Prince Hassan for bringing hope to the sad landscape of the Arab world today. Talili noted that the prince's adherence to the values of tolerance, reason, and human rights has been an inspiration for the Muslim people. Bob Carey told the audience about the accomplishments of Prince Hassan, who's been honored by more than 20 countries and has risked his life over and over again for the sake of dialogue. And Carey welcomed the prince as a, quote, friend of peace and freedom. And then... Stephen Rockefeller, you've heard the name, haven't you? Surely you've heard the name. Stephen Rockefeller made these perhaps prophetic comments. Quote, good evening. First of all, I'd like to express my profound gratitude to Prince El Hassan for accepting the invitation to share with us his courageous vision of a Muslim centrist platform for democracy in the Arab world. Still quoting. Stephen Rockefeller said Prince El Hassan's branch of the Hashemite family is directly descended from the Prophet Muhammad, and he occupies a unique place as a spiritual, social, and political leader in the 42nd generation. Stephen Rockefeller continued to say this, Your Royal Highness, your participation in this evening's dialogue provides all of us with a rare opportunity to deepen our understanding of the great spiritual tradition of Islam, the contemporary situation in the Arab world, and promising paths to democratic social change, human development, and peace in the Middle East and worldwide. As the world enters a global phase in development, the peoples and nations of the world have a choice. Under the influence of ancient prejudice and ignorance and narrow self-interest, we can engage in a destructive clash of cultures and religions or recognizing that we share a common humanity and planetary home. We can cooperate and support each other in building an equitable, sustainable, and peaceful global society that respects cultural diversity and accepts pluralism there is no greater social and spiritual challenge today than the pursuit of the latter goal in our local communities and globally. And tonight's dialogue on the future of the Arab world and on building better relations between the U.S. and the Islamic world is of central importance to this undertaking. Now, folks, if some Joe Blow nobody had said something like that, it wouldn't mean much. But it was Mr. Stephen Rockefeller telling all these people that in our new global world that we must face head on, we've got a choice to make. Either we're going to go back the way of all this religion.